<clears throat> All right, here we are again. So this is our last meeting of the week, don't forget. Um, so we'll be here uh, every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for the next four weeks. And so today we were com not completely done with chapter five. Uh, we'll get back to that right now and then we'll pick it up with chapter six. So just a quick reminder, you should have the chapter three and five problem sets ready for uh, Monday, okay? So um, because we'll be done with chapter five by today for sure. Chapter six, that can wait, okay? All right, anyway. So uh, let me get everything open for you here. Um, all right, almost, here we are, here we go. So today's the ninth, another sweltering day I see out there. So anyway, so we just have to put up with it. All right. So just a quick review of what we were doing yesterday, or at least towards the end, not of course the entire class, but um, we were looking at three rules that we defined. Um, let's go back real fast. Okay, here we go. The three rules of probability that we were talking about in this chapter were the addition rule, which we finished yesterday, uh, and the complement rule, the multiplication rule, we really had not quite gotten through it yet. We were introducing several important concepts before we introduced the multiplication rule. So let's go back and revisit what we were doing with the multiplication rule so that we can finish it. And so let's see, here we go. So the multiplication rule is defined in terms of what we will call conditional probabilities. And those are taken from a table of joint probabilities where we also saw yesterday uh, so-called unconditional probabilities as well as joint probabilities. So let's review what all those terms actually mean. <clears throat> so we had a table called a joint probability table. And it's called that because every element on that table is the result of two things being true, or at least everything in the body of the table, not the totals, but all the other elements in the body of that table are the result of two things being true. So in this case, we chose a, as an example, a business school that has 500 total students and they have three different majors to choose from, as you can see, uh, finance, accounting and marketing. And they're studying at two different levels. BBA means they're getting a bachelor's degree in uh, business administration. Uh, in other words, it's a college degree. And then MBA is what comes after college. That is what we call graduate school. And here you're working on what's called a master of business administration, which you cannot do unless you've already had a college degree, uh, BBA. Okay, so in other words, this comes first. And if you feel very ambitious, you can go ahead and get another degree, which is called an MBA. So the numbers represent how many students fall into each category. And so we can tell just by looking, for example, at this 130 that I've circled, that tells me that of, out of the 100, uh, sorry, 500 business students, 130 of them are getting their bachelor's degrees in finance. And in a similar way, this other circled number here tells me that 35 of these students are getting their MBA in accounting. And of course, altogether, I've uh, sort of boxed off these six cells to indicate that there are six cases where we've got two things both being true at once. These others are just totals, okay? They have their own separate role to play. So if I wanted to know the probability then of randomly choosing somebody from this school that is getting their bachelor's degree in finance, all I have to do is count up how many students fall into that category and how many altogether are in the business school. So in a case like this, the probability would be 130 out of 500 or 26%. And it's that simple. And we'd write it, as you can see down here, this is the intersection symbol. And it is used to represent the English word and in other words, what we're saying here is that the probability of choosing somebody who's both getting a bachelor's degree and studying finance is 26% because there are 130 students in this category of which 500 are in the entire school. 
We also did one for um, MBA in accounting. We've already seen that 35 students fall into this category. Altogether, there are 500. So therefore, this probability must be 7%. Okay, so it's M and A. M, remember, means MBA. A means majoring in accounting. And all, of, now this, by the way, there's a special name for this type of probability. Um, the probability, um, if we haven't already defined this, um, the probability that two events are both true is known as a joint probability. Just like a joint in your body connects two different bones, okay, it's called joint because two different things are true. Okay, so that's where the name is actually coming from. Joint meaning both things are true at the same time. Here, the two things that are true are that we're getting an MBA and we're studying accounting. And so altogether, there are six joint probabilities in this table. That's why I circled or boxed this in. You can see there are six of them that we could calculate here. What about the totals though? What, what is their role here? All right, well, the totals mean that we're only interested in one thing. Um, for example, let's jump ahead here a little bit. Suppose I'm only interested in knowing the probability that a randomly chosen student is getting a bachelor's degree. I don't care about their major. What's the probability that they're getting a bachelor's degree? So what I'm gonna do then is count up all the bachelor's degree students, the ones that are majoring in finance, the ones that are majoring in accounting, the ones that are majoring in marketing. The grand total is 400, as you can see right here, out of 500 in the entire business school. And so therefore, based on the logic we've seen up to this point, this probability must be 400 out of 500, which is 0.8. All right, so you notice how only one thing needs to be true here. This type of probability has two possible names. This type of thing is known as an unconditional probability. Although it is sometimes also called a marginal probability. They both mean the same thing. And altogether, if you look at these totals, there are five <clears throat> of these unconditional probabilities, uh, which you can see these three are all unconditional and so are these two. In other words, for example, if I wanted to know the probability that a randomly chosen student is majoring in accounting, that will come from this column total, 215, out of 500. So therefore, based on the logic we've been using up to this point, that has to be 215 out of 500, which is 43%. And I've, I've, I've put the rest of them together in this chart so you can go ahead and uh, summarize them. Now, what I did here um, is I put together a table where instead of having the actual totals, what I've done is replace them all with probabilities, okay? In other words, uh, you might recall this one was 130 and this was 500. That's where this 26% is coming from. So in a table like this, we don't know the actual numbers. We only know the probabilities, but in many cases, that's all that we really need to know. Okay, so if I just wanna know, for example, the probability that somebody's getting their bachelor's degree in marketing, I can go right here to this cell. It doesn't really matter to me how many students fall into that category. I'm only interested in the probability. If I do need the actual totals, well, then I need to go back to the old table. In other words, suppose that I'm planning on mailing um, an invitation to a marketing party uh, to only the marketing majors. Well, then I'd better know how many marketing students there are. 
But if I'm only interested in finding out what proportion of the student body are marketing majors, then I only need these numbers right here. So we should be prepared to use either type of table for our calculations, either the raw totals or the actual probabilities themselves. Okay. Usually we'll use this one because it's more straightforward, but um, you know, you have to be prepared to use either type of table. Now we've saved the best for last. I did mention earlier that there are three different kinds of probabilities that we need to understand to define the multiplication rule. The last and the most important one is called conditional probabilities. And what's happening here is that the probability of one event depends on the occurrence of another event. So let me just show you a quick intuitive example of what this means. What if I am a farmer, let's say, let's think of a completely non-financial example today. Just think of the following two scenarios. The, let's say that you are told that the probability of having a record crop of, let's say corn, as a farmer this year, I'm probably my setting a record is 10%. Now, what if I find out that the rainfall this year, or we expect that the rainfall will be unusually high this year. Okay. In other words, we're expecting the weather service has told us to expect a very rainy season. So would that not cause us to adjust our probability? Now here I'm saying to myself, I believe that this year I can set a new record with probability 10%. But then the weather service says, you know, this year we're gonna have more rain than usual, which is good for corn. Might not not adjust. What I probably would say to myself now, well, given that information, maybe I should revise my estimation of the probability of getting a record crop this year. I mean, if it's gonna rain that much, I'll probably have more corn than usual. So what I'm gonna do now is revi revise this to say, the probability of a record crop of corn, given that it will be unusually rainy, I'm gonna revise my opinion of that to 20%. Does that make sense? Yes, I mean, as long as rain is good for uh, corn. Now, some crops don't like it to be too rainy, but let's just say corn is not one of those crops. Let's just say every drop of rain is helpful to the corn. So with that extra piece of information, my probability is different now, isn't it? It's even more likely than ever before that I'm going to get that record crop. So, what I've done here is I've taken, in the first case, uh, let's see, hold on. This, this is what we would call an unconditional probability because it is not dependent on any other events taking place. This one, on the other hand, because it does depend on whether or not it actually is rainy this year, unusually rainy, we're gonna call this a conditional probability because whether or not I have a record crop depends on whether or not it actually does turn out to be unusually rainy. Okay, so with that extra piece of information about the rain, I've revised my forecast for my record crop of corn revise it upwards. And so this is now referred to as a conditional probability as opposed to the first one, which is an unconditional probability. All right, now I hope that made some kind of sense um, and that what, what we're about to do will be a little bit more straightforward because of that. But the logic here is that in each case, we'll have, we'll be calculating the probability of one event based on the some other event taking place. All right, let's take a look at this one. Given, uh, going back to our student example, 
Suppose that we want to know the probability that a randomly chosen student is majoring in marketing, but unlike in the past examples, this time we know for a fact that this student is getting their uh, bachelor's degree. Okay, so instead of picking somebody randomly from the entire business school, I'm only choosing from the bachelor's degree students. How does that change my calculations? Now before, what I would have done is I would have said, well, you know, in the entire student uh, body here, I've got 110 marketing majors out of 500. Okay, it's completely different now, isn't it? How is it different? In fact, you know, let me copy this just so I can show it to you. Uh, let's see, where was I? Okay, so um, this time, let me get rid of that bold face here. Um, I'm interested in marketing, marketing students. So the probability of getting a marketing student from the entire student body Hold on one second. That's better. So the probability of getting a marketing student from the entire student body is 110 out of 500. Which is 22%. This is an unconditional probability. But now I'm being told that I've chosen the student, not from the entire student body, but from only among the bachelor's degree students. So in other words, I can rule out any of the MBA students and focus all of my attention on this row right here. So now this is gonna change everything because there's 90 bachelor's degree students getting their degrees in marketing and there's 400 bachelor's degree students. So the probability of choosing a marketing major and I'll show you the correct terminology for this in a second, choosing a marketing major from the BBA students is now going to be okay 90 out of 400 which is 0 0.225 okay and this type of probability is a conditional probability because it depended on our knowledge of the fact that this student is known to be a bachelor's degree student. And the two are not equal to each other, are they? Which suggests that the proportion of marketing majors is different among the bachelor students than the MBA students. Okay, so in other words, the probability does depend on which group we have, the entire student body or the bachelor students. All right, now, how do we express that information? There's a formal way of expressing a conditional probability. So let's do that right now. The probability of choosing a marketing major, given that he or she is pursuing a bachelor's degree is written as where that bar in the middle is pronounced given that. So in other words, that's a much more compact way of saying what we had earlier. 
uh, what's the probability that the student I've chosen from among the business student, uh, bachelor's degree students is studying marketing? So that slash is pronounced given that. And that tells me that this event is known to be true. This event is what we're actually trying to calculate the probability of. All right, so we call that a conditional probability. Now we've already seen that number is 90 out of 400. Or 0.225. Now, here's where it gets interesting. What exactly did I do? Now, I looked this up in the table, but there's actually a formula I can use that will do this just as easily. And if you look at these very carefully, this could be rewritten as 90 out of 500 divided by 400 out of 500. Now, why would I do that? Because 90 out of 500 is the probability of getting both a bachelor's degree and a marketing uh, degree. Four hundred by itself is the probability of getting a bachelor's degree. So, in other words, what I've just done is demonstrated that this expression can always be calculated by taking the joint probability of these two events, T and B, and dividing by the probability of the event that's known to be true. And so that is my general formula for calculating any conditional probability that I need. So even if I don't have a whole table like this, I should be able to calculate a conditional probability as long as I have the right information. Uh-huh. So now you can see why we saved this one for last, because it is a bit complicated. But after we do a few more of these, you'll say, ah, it's easy. What's the problem? All right. Well, there is no problem. All right. So let's see if we can come up with another one. Ah, here we go. I'm going to take a peek down here. Oh, here we go. Um, what if we want to know the probability that a randomly chosen student is getting their MBA given that he or she is majoring in accounting? Okay, so in other words here, what's happened is I've chosen somebody from the accounting majors and I wanna know the probability that they're getting their MBA. Well, how do I do that? And in terms of symbols, this can be written as, okay, remember what you know is in the, on the right-hand side here. It's not the denominator. This is not a ratio. It may look like one, but it's not. This is the known event. We're told that this person is studying accounting. That's a known event. It's a done deal. There's no mystery about it. With that information in hand though, what now is the probability that they're getting their MBA? So as we saw earlier, you can find this as the probability of M and A over the probability of A. Now, all we need to do is go to the table. Now we've done these before, we know how to calculate. In the numerator, you have a joint probability. In the denominator, you have a conditional probability. So. M and A, let's go to the table. Oh, there it is. And this one down here is just A. All right, this is M and A. And this is A. So that means I need the ratio of 0 0.07 
over 0.43. All right, well, that couldn't be any easier. All right, 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.43, 0 0.16, let's say 28. Okay, all conditional probabilities are calculated in exactly the same way. You've got a joint probability in the numerator and in the denominator, you have the known event. All right, so with all that being said, we're now formally ready to define the multiplication rule. Now, when you see it, you'll say, oh, I understand why we needed all this background because it's defined in terms of conditional probabilities. Now, the multiplication rule can be written in two equivalent ways. So I've got them both written on the next slide. Let's see what it is. Oh yeah, there you go. Look at all those conditional probabilities. Yes, we need to know this stuff. and they'll both give us the same result. Now, under some conditions, one is more useful than the other. It depends on what kind of information you have, but they both mean the same thing. Okay. So let's do some examples. We'll start with this case. We choose a card from a deck and A will represent the event that the card is black and the B will be the event that the card is an ace. So that means that the event A and B is the event that the card is a black ace because both things are true. What we're gonna do here is use the multiplic multiplication rule in two different ways, both ways actually, to calculate this probability that the card is a black ace. Okay, so in other words, the probability of this happening can be calculated with the multiplication rule. Now, before we go any further, I just want to point out in this particular case, we don't actually need the multiplication rule. Why not? Because each card is equally likely to be chosen. There are two black aces in the deck. Therefore, we know in advance that the correct answer is two out of 52. But let's just use the multiplication rule to prove this. It's kind of nice that we already know the answer up front, but it's we need to understand how this rule works because this will not usually be the case. It's very unusual that you already know the answer in advance. So how would we do this? Now remember, there's two equivalent ways of doing this. So we'll start with this one. And so the challenge is basically to figure out the two individual probabilities. So in other words, the probability of A is easy. There are four aces in the deck of 52 cards. So that's either four out of 52 or one out of 13. It means the same thing. But what about the probability B given A? Uh -huh. Now in English, this means Given that the card is an ace, what is the probability that it is black? Well, we know that there's four aces, two of which are red and two of which are black, which means that this must be two out of four or one half. 
All right, so in other words, we're being told that the card is an ace. We know that there's four aces, two black, two red. Therefore, this probability is a half. So when we move these up here, this is two out of 20, uh, sorry, one out of 26. Whereas back here, um, we yeah, this is actually, of course, the same as one over 26. So that means we've done this correctly. We've set it up correctly to come up with the correct solution, which is one out of 26. Now it's time for the second uh, version of the multiplication rule. Let's try that. Okay, so PB, probability B is one half. Why? Because in a 52 card deck, 26 are red and 26 are black. So this probability is 26 out of 52 or simply one half. The challenging one is A given B. So how does that work? This is the probability that the card is an ace given that it is black. So in other words, now you know that there's 26 black cards of which two are aces. Spades and clubs, okay. So in other words, this probability is two out of 26. So you've got, or you can write that as one thirteenth if you want to. So up here, I can write this as one thirteenth times one half. And oh, what do you know? It's one out of 26 again. So we just use the multiplication rule in two different ways to demonstrate that the probability of getting a black ace is one out of 26, all right? So you can see it's a little challenging but you know, if we were careful and approach it logically, we should have no trouble applying this rule. All right, so now you might recall that when we introduced the addition rule, we had a special version, which was a little simpler and we were only allowed to use that special version when A and B were mutually exclusive. Okay, in other words, you might recall that, um, let's go back here real fast. From all the way to yesterday, this is one of the good things about having such an intense class. Um, whatever we are referring to, it only happened within a matter of days ago, not weeks, days. So let's recall how that worked we have the full approach. This is the, the actual multi, uh, sorry, addition rule. But when we have mutually exclusive events, we can simplify this. And what we're essentially doing is dropping out this term. Okay, so in other words, this is the full or general addition rule. The simplified version means you just drop out this intersection and that's because okay a this probably equals zero when a and b are mutually exclusive
something comparable to that is going to be true with the multiplication rule. There will be a simplified version, but it is not to be used when A and B are mutually exclusive. It requires something different to be true. Okay, so we'll introduce that right now. So when can we use the simpler version of this rule and what does it look like? Those are some very interesting questions. All right, uh, let's see if I can find it. Here it is. Independence, yes. Okay, it's possible for two events to be independent of each other. Now, do not confuse this with being mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive simply means that two events have nothing in common with each other. They can't both be true. Events are independent if they do not affect each other. In other words, if the probability of one is not influenced by the probability of the other event. So like, um, let me show you a quick example of this. Suppose that A is the event that Bitcoin rises by 10% tomorrow. And B is the event that it rains tomorrow. Well, would you think that rain could uh, influence the value of Bitcoin? Or could Bitcoin influence the likelihood of rain? No, A and B are independent because the probability of each event does not affect, or actually what I should say is the occurrence of one event does not uh, influence the probability of the other event. In other words, think of it as two things that are completely unrelated to each other. I, I couldn't, uh, this is the best example I can think of at the top of my head, but um, it just means the two things that are unrelated to each other. So now here though, we need a much more formal definition to prove or disprove whether or not two events are independent. Okay, so how does that work? Um, let's see, let me just jump ahead and show that to you right up front. This is what independence actually means. And by the way, I just wanna mention that both of these conditions must be true. Um, if not, then A and B are not independent. In other words, if one is the true or the other or neither, then we do not have independence. Both of these things must be true. And so what is it actually telling us? Knowing that B is true does not, uh, sorry, know that A is true does not affect probability B. That's what the first sentence means. The first statement means knowing that A is true does not affect the probability of B. Knowing that B is true does not affect the probability of A. All right, so intuitively, it just means events, like I said, um, like with the Bitcoin and the rain, if you knew that it was raining, does that influence the probability of Bitcoin going up? No, of course not. If you know that Bitcoin is going up, does that influence the probability of rain? Of course not. So if this is true, look what happens to the multiplication rule. Watch how easy it is. Oh my God, it's so simple. We don't have any conditional probabilities at all. Well, <laughs> it's just the probability of the two individual events. All right, so you know what, why don't we make up a quick example of this?
A coin is flipped twice. Um, a is the event that the first flip is a head. Um, B is the event. The second flip is a head. Now, if you flip the coin and it turns out to be a head, does that influence the probability of getting another head on the second flip? The answer is no. A and B are independent because the second flip is not influenced by the first flip. Therefore, the probability of getting both, um, actually, let's move this on to the next slide. Therefore, the probability of getting both heads is It's just a quarter. <clears throat> okay. Now let me show you another example. Uh, this is the, this is kind of interesting. Um, suppose um, a card is chosen from a deck. It is replaced in the deck, and then a second card is chosen. And now we've put A equals first card is red. B is the event that the second card is red. Now, since the entire deck is intact, When the second card is chosen, the probability of getting a red card on the second uh, choice. All right, actually, I should word it a little differently of getting red on the second card is the same as getting red on the first card, the two events are independent. So therefore, the probability of them both being red can be calculated very easily as one quarter. And by the way, um, when this is this type of experiment is carried out, this process is known as sampling with replacement. Okay, now let's try another case though that will help us understand why this multiplication rule is so important.
Suppose a card is chosen from a deck. A second card is chosen without replacing the first card. And again, A means uh, the first card is red. B is the second card is red. Well, now this is a very different situation, isn't it? Because when we pick the second card, something's missing, isn't it? These events are not independent. The probability of getting red on the second card depends on whether the first card was red. Okay, so in other words, if the first card was red, then the probability of getting the red on the second card would be uh, 25 out of 51 because one card is missing and one red card and it was red. Let's put it that way. So there's only 25 red cards left and there's only um, 51 cards in the deck. On the other hand, what if the first card was black? Okay. If this first card was black, then the probability of getting a red card is 26 out of 51 because all the red cards remain in the deck and there are still 51 cards left. So if I ask the question, what is the probability that both cards are red? We can't use the simplified multiplication rule. We're gonna use the general multiplication rule because there's a conditional probability involved. So in other words, in this case, the probability of them both being red equals the probability that the first is red and the second is red um, let's see given that the first card was red. Okay, in other words, we need two in a row to be red. The first card is red. The second card is red. Given that the first card is red. Okay, and so therefore we'll have one half. When the first card is chosen, 26 out of 52 are red. This is the one where we have 26 left. Uh, sorry, 25, 25, because one is missing out of 51. 25 out of 102, which is approximately equal to 25 over 102 or 0.245. All right, so um, yeah, we don't wanna spend all morning on conditional probabilities, especially because the final topic in this chapter is actually an extension of what we've just done, which we'd like to get to right now. It sounds it's going to look very scary when we first see it, but remember, it is really just an application of conditional probabilities. This theorem that we're about to see is actually very useful in medicine. Um, for example, uh, you may have heard about what's called a false positive, where you uh, take a test and um, the test shows positive when you don't really have the disease. There's also such a thing called a false negative, 
where your test shows up negative and yet you do have the disease. So the theorem that we're about to look at can help doctors figure out the likelihood that you, for example, actually have a disease with a positive test or don't have the disease with a negative test. So this theorem that we're gonna be looking at is called Bayes' theorem. And of course it's named after its inventor, Thomas Bayes. Thomas Bayes was a very interesting character. I, believe, I think he lived in the 18th century. Let me just confirm that. What was interesting, that, that's not the interesting part. So this Thomas Bayes, um, yeah, I figured the 1700s. What was unusual about Bayes' life is that he wasn't a mathematician, not really, he was a minister. His main job was being a minister. And while he was a minister, he wrote a lot of very important papers, which now are collectively known as Bayesian statistics. And he um, obviously was very talented at this stuff, but he was a minister who happened to dabble in statistics. And it became not only important, but it became a separate branch of statistics. Um, in fact, it revolutionized the whole field of, of statistics because it's a very different way of looking at probability theory. So some statisticians call themselves Bayesians because they really follow what he said. Others don't, don't, don't do this at all. In other words, it's one of those things that you either become a specialist in it or you don't mess with it at all. Now it says here, uh, most of what we know about him today was published after his death, um, but yes. And, and you know, he wrote theological stuff too. I mean, he's, he was a minister, but uh, it, it's pretty clear that math is where his heart really was. So anyway, what we're about to do is look at his theorem, which assumes, um, let me just show you what exactly we're assuming here. Suppose that we've got a situation where one of two events may be true. And let's say that either we have strong rainfall and weak rainfall. And that pretty much covers all the possibilities. Now, we're going to illustrate this Bayes' theorem with a, an important graphical device, which you've probably seen before, which is called a Venn diagram. It's perfectly suited to illustrate the relationships between sets. So in our Venn diagram, we're gonna, in this example, we're gonna cut this in half. Here we have the strong rainfall and here we have the weak rainfall. And all of this is just background. What we really care about is the event, let's call it B, record crops. Okay. So that will be illustrated by a circle. This is a set. Within set B, we have record crops. Outside of set B, we do not. So the diagram is set up to illustrate the idea that whether or not we have record crops depends on the rainfall. All right, so if I told you, for example, that this year we had weak rainfall, you'd like to be able to figure out the probability of record crops. So this is set up uh, based on conditional probabilities. And so you can see that obviously there's a connection between the rainfall and the crops. Now, let me show you the formula. Now the formula is gonna look scary. Now, by the way, this diagram could have been broken up into three pieces 
Uh, let's let's see a similar example. Suppose I decided to refine it a little. Strong rainfall. Average rainfall. And weak rainfall. There's nothing to stop me from doing this, but, and by the way, then here's our event B, which is the record crops. And again, whether we have record crops or not, it certainly depends on which rainfall we get. Each of these three is an event. We're gonna give them special names. We're gonna call this one A1. This one will be A2, and this one will be A3. Now, two things have to be true for this theorem to work. All of these probabilities have to add up to one. But it's also important to note that none of these events overlap, at least not the A's. So this should remind you of what how we defined um, complements, but this is a more general idea. So we will say that A1 a2 and A3 form what we will call a partition of, now this box, by the way, represents the sample space for this experiment. So I'll put a little S up here to remind you, this box actually represents the sample space for an experiment that we're about to conduct. So we break up the sample space into these three pieces or up here it's two pieces. And we can have four or five or six or whatever, but there's only one event that overlaps with all three of these. This B is sometimes called the conditioning event. So, we're going, I'm going to show you the formula for calculating probabilities based on the setup. And you may be scary. It may look scary, but it really isn't. Okay. So are you ready? Now, it'll have a sum in the denominator. The reason why it has a sum is because it, the formula allows for the possibility of any number of A's um, in, in this uh, sample space. All right, so let me show you the formula and then we'll do an example and it'll start to make sense, I hope. All right, so here's the scary formula. Ooh, boy, that does look scary, doesn't it? Oh, yes, but I'm telling you, once you've done a couple of these, you'll discover that it's really not scary at all. So with two events in the partition, this simplifies to so you notice this I here. Uh, we don't know which one we, we're going to choose. So in the denominator, we have two terms. And that's it. The numerator will be either A, either A will be one or two. We don't know yet. With three events, in the partition, This is what will happen.
Hold on one second. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, I hope I have enough room here. Okay, I just wanted to show you those two because those are the two that we're going to be using. We're not going to have any more complicated versions than that. So um, the number of events in the partition, the number of A's that is, determines the size of the denominator. The numerator is always the same. We pick one of those events and that's what's going to happen in the numerator. All right. Well, are we ready? Well, let's see. Now this example, there's two examples here, I think. No, there's just the one. Uh, let's do it. By the way, I just want to point out that as always, there's more than one way, one way of doing this. You may have seen an, an approach before which involves trees, tree diagrams, but this one is just more straight ahead algebra. All right, let's just take a look at this. So next year, the probability that the economy is in recovery is 20% and in recession is 80%. So already you can see where this is going. We have a partition, A1 is the recovery and A2 is the recession. They do not overlap and their probabilities add up to one. The conditioning event is a stock market crash, which we'll call B. Okay, now, in order to solve any problems here, we have to be given several different types of information of which at least one is a conditional probability. So just based on what you're seeing up there, you can tell already that the probability of A1 is 0.20 and the probability of A2 is 0.80. Now, these are the interesting ones. If the economy recovers, the probability of a crash is 10%. Now remember, B represents a crash. So this is a conditional probability because it means that we're defining the probability of a crash with the knowledge that the economy has recovered. Ah, now you see, remember A1 is the recovery. So this 10% is the conditional probability that we have a crash given that the market is recovering. The second piece of information here is that if we're in a recession, on the other hand, that probability jumps all the way up to 0.40. So all of this text is giving me all the information I need. I have four probabilities now the question is, what am I trying to calculate? All right, so I'll give you a minute to catch up with this. I know it's very tricky. But like I said, um, once you've done one or two of these, um, you'll start to get used to it very, very quickly. All right, so what is the question we're being asked? If the stock market crashes, what is the probability that we're in recession? Or to rewrite it a little bit, what is the probability that we're in recession given that the stock market crashes, which is the same thing as saying
A1 given B. And so you can see this is, let me just copy this uh, formula again. This is clearly a job for Bayes' theorem. where the I's will be replaced, well, these at least will be replaced with one. Okay, so I'm going to use Bayes' theorem. I'm first, the first challenge is to write it out. Then all I have to do is plug in the numbers and solve. All right, so let's jump ahead here a little bit and let's see, here we go. I'll just copy this. That's the general version. So you see what's happened here. Um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I think I goofed. Uh, recession was A2. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, this was supposed to be A2. Sorry. I, you were probably wondering what was going on. Um, recession was defined as A2. So that's my fault. Sorry about that. Okay, so yes, we're, we're saying, what's the probability that we're in a recession, A2 that is, given that we see uh, that the market has crashed. Now we're ready. All right, so in other words, you notice what I've done. In the numerator, these I's have all been replaced by twos. The denominator is determined by the size of the partition. I have to include both the A1s and the A2s. Now, let me also remind you what these probabilities were. A1 was 20%. A2 was uh, 80%. These have to add up to one. The probability of B given A1 was 10%. Now there's a crash during a recovery it has a 10% chance and a crash during a recession has a 40% chance. So now you just plug them in and you get 94%. So if we see that the market is crashed, there's a 94% chance that we're in the middle of a recession. All right. Okay. So All right. Well now that was a bit of a nightmare, but that's all right. Now that by the way was the end of chapter 5. That was our overview of probability theory. In the next chapter, we're going to introduce some more very important concepts. But I think, I don't know, maybe they're a little more straightforward than what we're seeing here. This is pretty complicated. I, I'll agree with you. Um, but like I said, also, once you've done some of these Bayes theorems problems, they seem like a nightmare, but after two or three of them, you should be fine because they're always the same. All right, so now, of course, it's 11 something. Um, let's not start a new chapter right now before we have our morning break. I'm sure we could all use a little stimulation before that's, that happens. So we'll start chapter six in a few minutes. Um, and this is, again, another really important chapter. Uh, we're introducing some really and truly important concepts that we'll see throughout the rest of the course. And, but now here's a good piece of news. Once we start diving into this chapter though, the calculators that you have, if you have, for example, a TI-84 or something like that, what we're doing in this chapter, some of this functionality is already built into your calculator. So 
the calculators will actually start to become extremely helpful in working on these problems. Up to this point, that hasn't really been the case. But now all of a sudden, the calculator will lend you a huge helping hand with a lot of these problems. So while they may look scary, and they kind of are, um, at least you've got this calculator to lean on to help you with your uh, calculations. So you can focus more of your attention on understanding the results. Okay, so let's knock it off for a bit like we always do at this point. And when we get back, we'll be fully refreshed and ready to dive into some more very important and exciting concepts. All right, so I'll see you all in a little while.
All right, here we are again. So let's start chapter six. And don't forget chapter three and five problem sets are due next Monday. So we'll just start six today. Um, obviously we won't finish it, but we can get started. <clears throat> so what are we doing here? Well, there's two extremely important concepts we're about to introduce. As you can see, one of them is called the random variable. And one of them is called a probability distribution. And we'll be using these throughout basically the rest of the course. And um, should you choose to take a more advanced statistics course down the road, um, you'll continue to need these concepts. You never know. <laughs> That's right. You might have thought this was it for stats. No, there's more if you want it. It's out there. But um, anyway, what exactly is a random variable? Now, this is a very strange um, naming convention because a random variable is really not random and it's really not a variable. It's actually a function. And what it does is it takes the outcomes of a random experiment and it assigns them numerical values. So what does that mean? All right, well, let's just say that, um, just to make up something on the spot, suppose that, oh, I don't know, a marketing firm is doing research on consumers' favorite color. Okay, they're, they're trying to figure out, let's say um, Apple is about to bring out the new iPhone. They wanna know what colors they should make available. Okay, obviously it doesn't make sense to pick a color that nobody likes. And they usually, of course, you know, they usually have black and then they have some unusual ones. But um, so imagine that, <clears throat> the experiment consists simply of asking random people at a mall what their favorite color is. Now, the problem with colors, of course, is that they're words. They're, they're not numbers, they're words. So for statistical research, it might be better to have numbers rather than colors. So suppose that we create a random variable that does the following. A random variable is defined as follows. Okay, red equals one, blue equals two, green equals three, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a very simple example of a random variable. Literally, all it's doing is taking all the possible outcomes of our experiment and assigning them numbers. And usually numbers are easier to work with than colors. Um, now, in a case like this, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But there are other cases where it means uh, makes things so much simpler. And in fact, one of the nice things about doing it this way is that... <clears throat> we may be able to calculate formulas to help us determine the likelihood that people will choose certain colors. Okay, so having numbers instead of uh, letters or words or whatever the case may be is a very valuable thing to have. So why don't we revisit the example we had in an earlier chapter where we rolled the die twice and we were only focusing our attention on whether the die, the sum of the die turned out to be even or odd. <clears throat> Okay, so remember, or actually it's not the sum, it's the individual roles. So we have four possibilities, EE, e, EO, OE, and OO. So let's say that we're only really interested in the even numbers. Okay, what matters to us is how many evens turn up. Not the actual sequence of roles, but how many evens did we get when we roll the die twice. All right, so how would that work? Well, you could take a table. Now, by the way, each element in a sample space is often referred to as a sample point. So these are the sample space elements. And you can see there's four of them. Now, X is the random variable. It is defined as the number 
of evens that turn up when we roll the die twice, obviously. So with EE, we get a two. With EO, we get a one. With OE, we get a one. And with OO, we get a zero. So X is a random variable because all it's doing is assigning numbers to the outcomes of this experiment. Now, I think you'll agree that these are easier to deal with than these letters. And in fact, we could potentially at least use these numbers to come up with a formula that helps us calculate the likelihood of getting, for example, two odds or two evens. So having a number, like I said before, is much more useful than having to deal with letters or colors or flavors or you know geographical regions, whatever the case may be. All right, now, based on what we've done in previous chapters, we can now define probabilities for the different possible values of X. So for example, the probability that X equals zero is really just the same thing as the probability of getting two O's. And we've already seen that each of these has a probability of one quarter. All right, just a quick refresher here. Because of the way the experiment was conducted, each of these outcomes has the same probability, which is one fourth. Therefore, the probability that X equals zero because it simply means getting two odds is therefore equal to one quarter. How about the others though? Well, for example, what about the probability that X equals two? Let's go directly to that one. The probability that X equals two is also a quarter because this is the same thing as saying the probability of getting two E's. So these two each have a probability of a quarter. The interesting one is what about the probability that X equals one? Uh, let's move this over here. This can happen in one of two ways. Either we get EO or we get OE. So therefore, look what happens. We simply add these up. One quarter plus one quarter is one half. So what we've been able to successfully do is assign probabilities to each possible value of our X, which itself is a random variable. Now we can put all of this together in a table. So let's do that right now. We have all the different possible values of X and the probabilities of these X's. This table is known as a probability distribution. because what it does is it shows us the probability of every possible value of X. <clears throat> and if you wanted to, you could actually include um, these sample outcomes in this chart. Just to remind yourself what each of these X's actually means. So this table is the probability distribution. X itself is the random variable. So basically in two steps, we're going from outcomes to values, uh, numerical values, which in turn are being associated with probabilities. Now, in statistics, much of the time, 
a probability distribution will not be a chart, although certainly it's possible, uh, but it's kind of awkward, especially if you have a lot of possible outcomes. So in most cases, a probability distribution will be presented or represented as a formula or function rather than a table. Okay, and we're going to see some examples of that in this uh, chapter. Most of the time, the tables are impractical unless there's only a small number of possible values. The majority of the time, we'll be seeing formulas. And this is, by the way, where the calculators will start to come in very handy because the formulas that we'll, we'll need for the most part are in your calculators. All right, now what we'd like to point out here is that if you look at this probability distribution very carefully, it has a couple of very important properties. All right, so in fact, let, let me just quickly redraw that up here. Two things that we need to note here. Each probability individually is non-negative. And the sum of these probabilities is one. These are two requirements of what we'll call a valid probability distribution. And they're taken directly from the axioms, the first two axioms of probability. So in order for a probability distribution to be valid, it must have those two properties. So you're probably wondering what would an invalid distribution look like? All right, well, let me show you a couple of examples. I mean, if this is valid, what would be invalid? All right, that's a very good question. So we're gonna look at two of them. And we're gonna to try to figure out what the problem is. All right, so let's try, let's see. Now, X can, X can be anything. It doesn't have to be zero, one, and two. Let's just say X can be one, two, and three. So let's see, how about this one? 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.2. Oh, bad luck. Okay, the sum of the PXs must be one. And here's another one that doesn't make, <laughs> doesn't make it. The sum is one which is, but that's not the problem, is it? The probability that X equals two is negative. We can't have that. So these are both examples of invalid probability distributions. Now, all of the results we're about to derive, of course, only apply to valid probability distributions. So we just have to keep our eyes open. Um, if your distribution is not valid, then it, you cannot apply any of our results to it. All right, now, it turns out that there are two basic types of random variables. So X, remember, is our random variable. The chart showing its probabilities is the probability distribution. So there are two basic types. I'll just mention that right up front.
right? There's really only two. Now, if you want to be super technical, which we will not do in this class, there are some bizarre cases besides the two I'm about to show you, but let's just focus on these two. The two basic types of random variables are known as discrete, and we'll explain that in a minute, and continuous. All right, so like I said, yes, there are technically a few others, but these are the majority of uh, fall into these two categories. All right, what does it mean to be discrete? Now, the chart that we just got through drawing, not these guys, this one, if you notice, there's only three possible values for X. So X can only assume a finite number of different values and therefore it is defined to be discrete. Okay, now it can have a large number of values, but as long as the number is finite, X is said to be a discrete random variable. Okay. Well then it's pretty should be pretty clear what it means to be continuous. If X can have an infinite number of different values, it is said to be continuous. So the word continuous means basically an infinite number of possibilities. All right, let me show you a couple of quick examples of this um, before we get any further into this. Um, suppose that X represents the number of students in a class that are left-handed, okay? X is a discrete random variable because it cannot, it must be finite. In other words, you can't have an infinite number of students in the class in the first place, much less an infinite number of lefties. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, let's take a look at this. Suppose that X represents the time until um, the next text message arrives. See how high tech I'm getting there? The next test me text message arrives. Now, this is a very different matter. Since the time can have a fractional component, for example, uh, 1.2147 minutes, the number of possibilities is infinite. Okay, therefore, X is a continuous random variable. All right, so in other words, what really ultimately comes down to um, is that you have a fractional part, therefore the number of possibilities is infinite. So we say X is continuous, whereas the number of lefties in the room is, is discrete because it has to be an integer. Plus there's only a finite number of students in the room to start with. Okay, so that being the case, if a, a random variable is discrete, 
its probability distribution is also said to be discrete. Okay, because in other words, you can't have an infinite number of probabilities associated with a finite number of outcomes. So the word discrete can be applied to either the random variable or the probability distribution. And the same thing is true for continuous random variables. Their distributions, their probability distributions are continuous because there's an infinite number of possibilities. Okay, and our case with the, uh, the dice rolling is of course a perfect example of a discrete random variable with a discrete probability distribution, which we've seen before. Now, when we analyze a random variable, there's a lot of useful information we can get from it by defining a series of measures. Now, you recall from chapter three, we defined a series of measures for samples and populations. And just a quick refresher of for your memory, even though it was only two days ago, um, we had measures of central tendency, which look at the center of the data. We had measures of association, uh, sorry, dispersion, which look at the spread of the uh, data. And we had measures of association, which under, help us understand the relationship between two variables, or the, I'm sorry, the, two samples or populations. Here we're looking at uh, random variables. So there were three sets of types of summary measures. We have for random variables, an equivalent set of measures, but their naming is a little bit different, okay? We run into this a lot in statistics. There can often be multiple names that mean the same thing. So we want to define measures for our random variables that will give us a lot of useful information, but their names are maybe slightly different and the formulas are certainly different. The main reason for that is because when you have a sample or a population, you do not have probabilities associated with them. You just have data, that's it. Here we do have probabilities, which we must incorporate into these measures. So while the basic logic behind these measures is similar to what we had with samples and populations, the calculations are obviously different. All right, so with all that being said, the summary measures of a random variable are called moments. Now, don't ask me why. Um, they, we could have called them measures too, but for some reason they're called moments. And we're only gonna focus in this class on three of them. There's plenty more, but we're only gonna focus our attention on three of them. Okay. So let's begin. All right, now when you look at the list, you'll say, you know what, I recognize two of them. The third one, I'm not so sure about. But again, this is one of those cases where there's equivalent names for the same thing. All right, so let's take a look at this list. Here we go. So like I predicted, you know the bottom two Expected value is just a fancy name for mean or average. I don't know why it's called this, but it is. The convention is to call this an expected value. The other two have the same names as they do for a sample or a population, variance and standard deviation. And the interpretation is exactly the same. These are two of the measures of dispersion that we looked at for samples and populations. So the expected value is an attempt to show me the mean or average value of my random variable and the variance and standard deviation are an attempt to capture the spread. So let's look at the formulas. Now, when you see the formulas, you'll recognize our old friend, the summation operator has come back to visit. All right, so don't be put off. You are very good at this now. 
So the expected value is often known as the first moment. Um, that's technical, you don't need to know that, um, but it, it's often called the first moment. The formal name is the expected value, but it's, remember, it is simply an average or mean value. Now, it turns out, well, all right, let's look at the formula first. So what it's telling you to do is this. So this expression means the expected value of X. Remember, X is a random variable. It is not a sample. It is not a population. And here's our old friend, the summation operator. This is a single value of X. This is the probability of Xi. All we're gonna do is go through all the Xs, multiply them by their probabilities and add them up. Okay, so I'll give you a minute to catch up there. Now, I wanna point out to you though, that this expected value is a weighted average of the possible values of X where the weights are probabilities. Okay, so think of this as a weighted average, except the weights themselves now are probabilities. All right. All right, so we're gonna apply this to our die rolling experiment. Now, if you recall, we created a table for that. There's only three possible values for X, zero, one and two. So let me just put it back up here real fast. And by the way, you can convert these into decimals if you want to. Now we can think of these as X1, X2 and X3. And we can think of these as the probability of X1 the probability of X2 and the probability of X3. So in our formula, we have the X's multiplied by their probabilities. So if you plug in all those numbers and add them up, it turns out to be one. And so I hope you can see that that makes sense because this means that on average, when we roll the die twice, we should get one even number. Right, of course, because each it's you're equally likely to get an odd or an even on each roll. If you roll the die twice on average, you should expect to get one even number. So not only are we able to calculate this very simply, but it conforms to our understanding of how dice work. All right. So I'll give you a minute to catch up. The variance is a little bit more challenging, but you'll recognize that it's very similar to what we did with populations and samples. All right, are we ready? All right, so let's take a look at the formula for the variance. Now, the, the variance, 
has um, a very scary looking definition, but um, after we look at that, I'll show you the actual formula that you'll be using to calculate the variance. So the variance is sometimes known as the second central moment of the random variable. And it measures, as you can expect, the degree of dispersion of X around its own expected value. In other words, how far out are the values likely to go from the mean? So it's the same concept as what we did in chapter three. Now, here's an interesting twist. You might be surprised to see this. As far as the notation goes, we're going to call this sigma squared. Now, didn't we just get through saying that sigma squared is the variance of a population? Yes, we did. So we're going to reapply it here to a probability distribution. The logic being that you should be able to tell which one you're working with. So for whatever reason, statisticians did not create new notations for random variables. They're basically using the same ones that we used in um, for uh, populations. So we'll continue to use the Greek letters with the understanding that you should be able to tell whether you're using a, a population or a random variable. I, I don't know if this is the smartest idea in the world, but that's how it's done. All right, it's like, you should be able to tell. You don't need a separate variable. That's their attitude. I guess they could have found a third language, but uh, instead of Greek and Roman, but um, or third alphabet, I should say. But no, they decided to stick with this. Now, having said that, some books do not use this notation. They will replace this with this. And you can see it's just the English word variance or a shortcut for it with X. So if you ever run into this, that's what it means. It's the same thing. Our book does use the sigma squared though. Okay. And of course, uh, oh, whoops. You'll recall that, I, if I forgot to remind you, this is the Greek letter sigma, specifically, it's the lowercase sigma. Whereas the summation operator is the uppercase sigma. All right, now let's do one of these. This is the formula, by the way. The, the, what you had before was the formal definition. This is the formula that we use to actually do the calculations. Now, if you remember the population variance, from, oh, all those hours ago when we learned about this, This part hasn't changed. Of course, you know, EX and mu mean the same thing. Okay, just be aware of that. They represent a mean. So that part hasn't changed. What's different is that instead of dividing your result by N, you're multiplying each of these terms by the probability. So in other words, the, what really separates the two is that this one down here is a weighted average. The one on top is not. That's the main difference between the two. Okay. So if you already know the expected value of X, this is not maybe quite as painful as it looks. So let's, let's go back. Remember, here's the results we had earlier. And also we previously calculated that expected value of X is equal to one. So what do I have here? X one. Oh, and don't forget, we can think of this as x1, x2, and x3. 
And this is the probability of x1, probability of x2, probability of x3. So here we have x1 minus is expected value squared times the probability of x1. And I've run out of space, so I'll move the rest of it down here. And so when you go through all the steps, you'll see that the variance turns out to be a half or 0.5. Now, intuitively, it, it is kind of difficult to make sense out of that. Um, we don't have to necessarily interpret it, but we do know, have to know what that value is. Now, as far as the standard deviation goes, here's, one, here's a good piece of news. The relationship between the variance and the standard deviation never changes. It doesn't matter if we're looking at a sample or a population or a random variable or whatever. Um, the standard deviation is always just the square root of the variance. So once we've got our variance, the standard deviation is easy. Literally, all we have to do is take the square root of a half to come up with our standard deviation. Now, as you can imagine, the standard deviation is written as sigma, okay? If the variance is sigma squared, the standard deviation is sigma. So I'm writing it down again for you. Remember, what's under the square root sign is the variance. So what I'm essentially just doing here is taking the square root of my variance. And you can see down here, the square root of a half is approximately 0.7071. So once you've got that variance done, the standard deviation is a breeze. All right. Now, um, it turns out, now, now that we understand what a probability distribution is and a random variable, um, the one we see here, the one we've been using is nice. It's, it's a good introductory discrete distribution, but it's not the most useful distribution in the world. It turns out that there are many discrete probability distributions that are very useful in practice. Okay, so in other words, um, there are many discrete probability distributions that have been invented over the centuries that are designed to be useful for real world applications. In fact, that's one of the things that really separates statistics from other quantitative disciplines. Everything we do here is designed to be useful. There's no other purpose for any result in statistics except to be useful. That isn't necessarily true in other disciplines, that's for sure. Um, a lot of results in calculus are designed or just proved because based on internal logic but they're not necessarily useful for anything in particular. Here, it's the other way around. Everything is meant to be useful. So there's many discrete distributions that have been invented over the centuries that are meant to be used for real world applications. Now, um, in some cases we know who invented them, in some cases we don't. But what's different about these is that these distributions 
can be used under specialized circumstances and are based on a formula rather than a table. And here's some good news. Many of these distributions are found in engineering calculators, such as the TI-8384 series and, and the more advanced ones, of course. So we're going to introduce two of them in this chapter, just two, that's all we have time for, but they're really very, very important. So I'll show you their names. The first one is called the binomial distribution, and you can see the word bi in there, which means two, which is a hint as to what it will be used for. And then we have Poisson, which is named after its inventor, a Frenchman named Poisson in the early 18th century, I believe. And in many applications, we'll be able to use these to get results that we need. Because a lot of real world situations can be modeled using either of these two distributions. So um, the binomial distribution is useful in circumstances when a random process is taking place in such a way that only uh, that there are only two possible outcomes so in other words this whole thing is tied to this number two all right so what would be a case where that's the case, uh, where we have this situation? Um, for example, this, this distribution is heavily used in the area of what's called quality control. For example, um, and by the way, this is something I saw on TV, so I'm not just making this up. Um, I saw a wonderful documentary about Lay's potato chips and how they actually make them. And you'd be surprised, it's almost 100% done by machines. But when the potato chips are heading towards the bags, at the last minute, there's a machine that actually checks the color of the chips. And if it doesn't look right, they're thrown into the garbage. The rest of them go on into the bags where they're wrapped up and sent out you know, to the market. So. Um, in the Lay's potato chip factory. Chips um, are segregated by color. Um, and there's only two choices, acceptable and unacceptable. In other words, you don't have like a bunch of different options. If the chip looks fine, it goes through. If it doesn't look right, it goes in the garbage. So if the factory wants to know, for example, and this is very important information, the probability of finding three unacceptable chips in a batch of a thousand chips and that might be considered unacceptable, by the way, it can use the binomial distribution. Okay? Because it's perfectly set up for that. Every chip is either acceptable or it's not. There's a machine. It's a really it's incredibly sophisticated system. And so the machine, it's like a laser beam that comes out and it looks at the color of the chip. And they can tell if it doesn't look right, the color seems to be off or there's spots on it, or there's burn marks. It just goes right in the garbage, okay? And it's just insane to watch this thing working. But 
either each chip is either one or the other. So if they find out, let's say that they're getting too many unacceptable chips, then they may stop the process and fix the machinery. So the binomial distribution would be well uh, used in this case because either chip, each chip, sorry, is either acceptable or it is unacceptable. Now, if on the other hand, we're doing something with multiple possibilities, then we're not going to use the binomial distribution. But if we are, then this would be the ideal probability distribution to use to make sure that something isn't going wrong with our production process. Um, the Poisson distribution, on the other hand, is used to determine the likelihood that a specific number of events will occur over a given time interval. For example, if a bank wants to know the likelihood that eight customers will use the ATM between noon and 1 p.m., this uh, can be done with the Poisson distribution because it involves time. People show up at the bank at random times to use the ATM. Um, the bank may need to know this because they're, maybe they're thinking about getting a second ATM and they don't want the customer standing in long lines because otherwise they'll go somewhere else. They can't know, that's no good. <laughs> so they'll say, you know, do we really have enough customers coming in here to justify the expense of a second ATM? Well, how do we figure that out? Okay, well, we use a probability distribution and that distribution can help us determine the likelihood of getting uh, too many customers coming at once for the ATM. So that's when we might use the Poisson distribution. So what we're gonna do, not today, of course, in this chapter is introduce a series of formulas that are associated with each probability distribution so that we can go ahead and calculate these probabilities. But we also have to understand when it is and it is not appropriate to use these distributions. Okay, so anyway, um, I think that we've done quite a bit of work for one week. Uh, we're, you know, in a normal semester, we'd be in probably early in week three by about now, easily. So uh, why don't you, you know, over the weekend, uh, work on chapter three and five problem sets, send them in to me by Monday, and um, we'll go ahead and dive more deeply into this chapter six. And then we'll take it from there. So uh, by the time we're done, uh, after four weeks, you'll have covered about 16 weeks worth of material and you'll be excellent statisticians. All right, so if you don't have any last minute questions, I'll see you all on Monday. You're welcome. I hope you had a good time today. <coughs> You're absolutely welcome. See you all next week. Enjoy the weekend, the long weekend. <laughs>